Before we begin today, I'm afraid I have to share some unfortunate news. Barry, one of our more prominent orderlies, has died. His body was found earlier today in his apartment. Cause of death has yet to be determined, though it's possibly linked to his recent run-in with patient 747. Police are currently investigating. I feel it's only right we take a moment to remember Barry for the man he was, as well as all the contributions he made here at Hillbrook. Okay, moment's over, back to work. Hillbrook Insane Asylum, patient file update. Entry by Dr. Quinton Quartermain. Patient number 200, Philip DeWitt. Or as he's referred to by our remaining orderlies, Ghost Writer. Eh, not a bad one. Kind of clever, actually. The nickname, I mean, not the patient. It's been a long time since I last met with number 200, and there doesn't appear to have been much improvement. His attitude is more positive, at least, though being happy about being held at Hillbrook just makes me question his sanity further. I wasn't able to get much in during the interview. He was far too busy trying to share his latest ideas with me. Would have given up at that point, but apparently when number 200 asks for attention, it's much safer for you and everybody else if you just indulge him for a bit. Look, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not the one who typically handles number 200. Partly out of professional courtesy, and mostly out of choice. There's only one reason I'm even reopening his file. As those of you who have been following my recent patient files may have noticed, there appears to be a recurring element linking their stories together. Or rather, their downfalls. Cross-referencing them and several more patient files documenting similar incidents, then dating them back as far as possible, has led me to this one. It appears that if I'm going to get to the bottom of this, I must take a most unwanted trip down memory lane. There's no shame in being second best. If anything, it's something to be proud of. But when such a title stalks you throughout your entire life, it can get tiresome. No matter how hard Philip DeWitt tried, his efforts were never considered quite as good as somebody else's. This state, this curse to be eternally in someone else's shadow, followed him throughout childhood, school, college, and now it appears was going to follow him into adult life. But DeWitt never let it get the best of him. In fact, these feelings of inadequacy drove him to work harder, to one day achieve his dream. Since he was young, DeWitt was enamoured by theatre. The glory of being on stage, putting on a performance for all to see and enjoy, basking in the thunderous applause of a loving audience, nothing could compare to that feeling. Or so he assumed he hadn't gotten the chance to experience it yet. It was clear from the beginning he didn't have the acting chops, nor the looks, to make it as a performer. No, his talents were for a more integral part of the puzzle. He wanted to be a scriptwriter. A director, the architect of the stories these players would bring to life. By the time he graduated, he must have written up over a dozen plays, ready to unveil each and every one to an adoring public. A shame then that his writing was just so... mediocre. Critics were quick to point out that what few productions DeWitt managed to get out with shock full of plot holes, bland predictable characters, and dialogue so egregious it'd make George Lucas look like George R. R. Martin. The Performing Arts Society DeWitt worked with was only a small community-based group, but even by their standards his work was underwhelming. And after seeing just how low their ticket sales were getting, the others soon barred him from heading any further projects. DeWitt was nothing if not persistent though. If the people here simply didn't get his art, then fine. He'd go somewhere else, find an audience that would properly appreciate his efforts. This is what prompted his move to London. That was where the big boys played. Here, theatre was more than just a passing fancy. 
There was an intrinsic part of the city's identity, its history, its very lifeblood. If he was going to find that spotlight he was looking for, this is where he'd find it, surely. He took up a few odd jobs to get by for a while, but eventually he got his big break. A theatre troupe called The Velvet Players was looking for new talent. While DeWitt's track record wasn't exactly great financially, or critically, he was well versed when it came to working on a stage, so they gave him a shot. DeWitt was excited, and when he saw the venues this troupe performed at, that excitement grew. The West End, the London Palladium, the Prince Edward Theatre, his plays would be performed on some of the greatest stages in the country! They would be, if it weren't for the fact that the position of director had already been filled. Kurt Addington was one of the biggest names in theatre. Born into the industry, he was writing his first vignette while DeWitt was still learning how to spell the word. The man was critically acclaimed throughout Britain, and in fact the world over, some of his plays even making it to Broadway. So between him and the man who just joined, it was clear which among the group would handle the script writing. DeWitt was instead assigned to the position of stagehand, someone who handled the backstage aspects. Though he proved to be an exemplary stagehand, he was not happy about this. Of course, he wasn't expecting to just be handed the role of director straight off the bat, but Addington could at least consider some of his story ideas, which he was more than willing to share during their meetings. And rehearsals. And live productions. And casual conversations. It's basically all he would talk about. He just wanted some acknowledgement. Sure, he was a part of the famous Kurt Addington's Velvet Players, who got to attend all the same big celebrity events as the man himself, but that's just it. He was a part. Just a fraction of a greater whole that even when combined together was mainly considered an addition to somebody more important. DeWitt couldn't stand it. This was worse than the community theatre. Yes, maybe he didn't put forth his A material back then, maybe he did squander his chance. But Allington wouldn't even give him a chance to squander! The tension between the two men wasn't lost on their fellow players. At first they politely ignored it, but after one instance when Addington asked DeWitt to fetch him some coffee, and DeWitt responded by hurling a rubbish bin at him while shouting that he's not his errand boy, he's a writer just like him, they felt the need to step in. They had a sit down with DeWitt, talked about some of the issues he may be going through, and suggested he maybe get some therapy. Of course, out of all the places he could have gone to get it, he came to mine. Yeah, the reason why I'm not DeWitt's regular doctor is because he and I have a bit of history. It looks like you're getting a two-for-one origin story today. I started out as a grief counsellor, believe it or not. It's through that I met my future ex-wife, Charlotte. She was a lawyer. We happened to meet while we were both working for the same family. I was there to help them for the loss of their grandparents, and so was Charlotte, really. They certainly seemed happier when she revealed just how much money they'd inherited. We dated for a while, eventually tying the knot after I got my degree, and had begun plans for my private practice. And you know what? I was happy. I was genuinely happy. Making a modest living as the town's local psychiatrist, Settling down and starting a family, I was completely content with how things were going. But not Charlotte. She always wanted more. It all began one day when we received a call from the law firm of Leighton and Law, the Cooper and Cooper of Great Britain. They were interested in recruiting Charlotte and were willing to pay a pretty penny to boot. Next thing you know, we're living it up in London rubbing shoulders with the upper class. Relocating my practice wasn't too hard. I may have lost my original clientele, 
but I soon found plenty of new ones being sent my way. Celebrities, CEOs, bankers, politicians, I became the go-to psychiatrist for the city's most elite, promising professionalism, dignity, and comfort. Unfortunately, the one thing I couldn't promise them was integrity. Leighton and Law called it a joint venture. I called it unethical. Charlotte called it necessary to pay for our new flat. The deal was they would have certain potential clients of their own sent to me. I do an evaluation on them under the guise of a regular therapy visit, then provide the firm with a full report. This was so Leighton and Law could avoid taking on clients that might be risky for them to cover. They had something of a spotless record to maintain. I had misgivings. This was of course a gross violation of doctor-patient confidentiality, but they were adamant that it was in everyone's best interests I go along with it, and made it clear that if I didn't, they might not be so interested in having Charlotte on board after all. Without that job, there was no way we could afford all the expenses that came with living in the city. In the end, I figured so long as nobody found out, nobody would get hurt. And I'd still be doing the job I enjoyed, as would Charlotte. That is one thing we've always had in common. Our careers always meant much to us. Perhaps too much. So wrapped up were we in all this drama, we neglected the one thing that should have mattered most to us. Our daughter, Abigail. The sudden move had been particularly rough on her. She had to finish her final term in a completely new college, a frustration she made sure to voice with us, more than once, very loudly. But she's an adaptive young lady, wasn't long before she was back into her studies. She was mainly into gymnastics, though that was more by her mother's urging. She was actually much more interested in martial arts, Wanted to become an MMA fighter, seriously. <laughs> of course, Charlotte couldn't have that. Our family had an image to maintain now, after all. Abigail was either going to be a proper Olympic athlete, or no athlete at all. I should have noticed how bad it was getting. How unhappy she was being dragged around all those balls and galas. Having to act all uptight. How, how didn't I notice? I'm a psychiatrist. For pity's sake, I'm her father. I should have just... <sighs> Sorry, I... I bit off track there, didn't I? Then again, it's partly thanks to Abigail that I became aware of Philip DeWitt. The two knew each other through a mutual friend, a lighting engineer called Tracy Brightmore. She too was finishing up her last term at college, and frequently did effects for the Velvet Players' performances. It was through her that word of me reached DeWitt, and since he could afford my services, I took him on. Frankly, I felt the need to get some honest work in. It wasn't long before I had DeWitt figured out. A classic case of inadequacy and jealousy resulting in vast narcissism. That kind of reaction may sound contradictory, but it makes perfect sense. Not receiving praise or admiration, always being overlooked, can create a longing for attention, which if left unchecked, can evolve into a sense of entitlement. That you deserve this thing and are being unfairly denied it. The fact that Addington wouldn't even read DeWitt's news stories only served to exasperate this feeling further. They weren't bad, no, quite the opposite. They were brilliant, great, greater than all of Addington's works put together. That's why he wouldn't use them. He was intimidated, scared that the name DeWitt would one day be plastered over Broadway instead of his. This was the toxic mindset that DeWitt had gotten into, and it was up to me to get him out of it. I approached the problem from multiple angles. I tried to get him to take pride in his work as a stagehand, help him recognise that it's still a vital part of the performance. That idea got shot down quick. DeWitt knew the role was important, he just didn't care. 
What did it matter if nobody knew it was him who was doing it? I tried to get him to rethink his motivation, to realise that a project driven by passion will produce a more quality product than one driven by the desire of fame, as that's a reward that comes after, meaning you'll be rushing through the creation part to get to it. Another dead end, trying to get DeWitt to admit to his faults is like trying to get blood out of a stone. Still, therapy is a marathon, not a sprint. There's no universal solution to every problem. But from my experience, there's one that always seems to do some good. I listened to him. Our sessions became more about him blowing off steam than anything else. Better him do it in my office than have him make a scene in front of Addington. As much as we hate to admit it, there are times when we need to express our negative emotions. Our anger, sadness, fear, disgust. Bottling them away, trying to pretend they don't exist, just feeds into them, making them stronger until they eventually overpower us. Do not misquote me now, that is not an excuse to start acting like a complete and total downer all the time. <coughs> yeah, I know, Waffles. This is coming from me, of all people. But what I'm saying is, we all need an outlet in life. And that's what I was for DeWitt. A person he could come talk to about his issues, who wouldn't just dismiss them as solid whinging. It's a policy I've always held, even since coming to Hillbrook. You can drug and electrocute a patient all you like. Sometimes, the one thing they truly need more than anything else, is someone who will listen to them. It was a few months later, I was in my office one day, just finished my last appointment, when Abigail stormed in, ranting about how I'd let her down again. The acrobatics exposition, god damn it! I was supposed to be there, I'd promised her! I know it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but fact was, I hadn't been paying her the proper attention as of late. I worked long hours and was rarely home. I kept telling her my work was too important for me to get any free time. Truth was, I was pretty much snowed under by Leighton and Law constantly dumping more clients on me. Of course, I could never bring myself to tell Abigail that. She knew nothing of our arrangement, and I wanted to keep it that way. We had an argument. Once we both calmed down, I admitted that she was right. I wasn't being a part of her life. I wasn't being the father she needed in what was, for her, a difficult time. I wanted to make it up to her, and luckily there was another event I could attend coming up for the end of the academic year. Looking for my calendar, my schedule would be fairly open that day as well. A bit of rearrangement here and there, nothing too major. Ultimately, there was only one session I ended up having to cancel. Guess whose it was? I was on my way to the college with Charlotte, yeah, I'd managed to rope her into coming too, when I received a call from DeWitt, I'd already explained to him that whatever he was going through, it was just going to have to wait to our appointment next week. But he was clearly riled up about something, most likely Addington again, as it always was. Frankly, I was getting tired of Addington myself, given how much DeWitt kept complaining about him. I simply wasn't in the mood to deal with this, so off the top of my head, I told him, the best thing you can do is be honest. Explain to him how he's making you feel, get it off your chest, and hopefully he'll understand. That's all I said, okay? That's all I said. Now, could I have made it clearer that he was to do this in conversation next time he and Addington just happened to meet up and not burst into the man's house in order to scream it at him? Maybe, but I can't afford that part where we're about saying. But yes, that is precisely what DeWitt did. Knocked on Addington's door, barged in the moment he answered, and proceeded to, as he put it, tear down that overblown ego of his. Ugh. All Addington saw, of course, was a home invasion. And people of prominence like himself know to take precautions for such events. Hence why he kept one of his golf clubs by the front door. He held it high, threatening to use it should he come any closer. But that just fell into DeWitt's delusions. Now Addington wasn't just intimidated by his greatness, he was willing to kill him over it. Well, he wouldn't stand for that. He rushed Addington, grabbing the club as he took a swing at him. 
The two struggled back and forth through the main hall, smashing who knows how many quids worth of furnishings as they went. Eventually, DeWitt got the upper hand, getting enough leverage on the club to ram its driver into Addington's forehead. Addington suddenly stopped struggling, letting go as he staggered backward, blood trickling down his face, before toppling over and striking his head on a nearby table as he fell. DeWitt stood there for a good long time, the once proud and noble Kurt Addington lying dead at his feet. Once it sank in what he had done, he got straight to cleaning up the scene. He'd read enough murder mysteries to know what to do. He had no immediate way of disposing of the body though, so he'd have to hide it for the time being. But it was as he was stuffing the corpse into a closet that something dawned on him. He was overcome with a sense of guilt. Not because he had just committed murder, he felt no shame there. No, it was because he had just remembered that the Velvet Players had a performance coming up in three months. The venue was booked, but they had yet to receive the script from Addington. A script that was now locked on a computer that only Addington knew the password for. Without it, the play would be doomed. But then it came to him. A solution so brilliant, yet so obvious. When the players first heard that their glorious director had become stricken with a debilitating case of the flu, they were plainly anxious. They were also a touch confused that it was DeWitt of all people who brought this information to them, but since he also brought the long-awaited script, they chose not to look a gift horse in the eye. He explained that he and Addington had at long last buried the hatchet, and that he'd be acting as his go-between while he was <clears throat> indisposed. He was able to keep up this facade through his access to Addington's mobile phone, sending out text messages in his name, and even impersonating him for the old phone call. A fake sore throat was enough to mask his voice. At long last, one of his masterpieces would hit the stage. He'd been certain to choose a special story, one he'd been crafting for nearly a year. He called it The Pen of Ambition. The title could have used a bit more work, but anyway. It told the tale of a downtrodden young man coming to the big city in hopes of achieving his dream of being a playwriter, and how he must struggle against those at the top who are too entitled, too engrossed in their own glory to see his great potential. Well, write what you know, I guess. Or in this case, what you think. Oh, but the jubilation he felt as he watched from backstage. The rapturous joy that enveloped him at every line's delivery. He was briefly annoyed when during the third act, one of the actors decided to ad-lib a little, but that aside, it was spot on. And when the house lights came on, and the players took a bow, Applause. Thunderous. Wondrous. Applause. The Pen of Ambition was an instant hit. Critics praised it for its insightful look into the world of stage plays, as well as its unique meta style of storytelling. Made all the more impressive when you take into account that its director was bedridden for most of its run. Truly Addington had done it again. Addington had done it again. Addington! DeWitt absolutely fumed when he saw that name plastered just above that review's five-star rating. The rating he had earned. One major flaw in this masterfully crafted scheme of his that he had somehow overlooked was that when you publish your work in someone else's name, any credit for said work is going to go to them rather than you. All of that effort, and he had just ended up raising Addington's undeserved profile higher than it already was. Even beyond the grave, that accursed glory hound continued to foil him. Now every cheer, every clap, every little bit of praise was an insult, a mockery at his expense. When the pen of ambition was nominated for a Critics Circle Theatre Award, his starved ego could take no more. He was going to get acknowledgement no matter what it cost. He took to social media and blabbed the whole thing, 
that he was the true writer, and that Addington had had nothing to do with it. At first, no one believed him, but as time went on and Addington failed to show time and again, people got suspicious. I mean, how long can a case of the flu go on for? Plus, when police did get involved, DeWitt couldn't be found for questioning. A search of Addington's residence revealed much. Hacking into his computer, they found no mention of the Pen of Ambition, adding credibility to DeWitt's claims. Though what sensed it was the discovery of the body in the bedroom closet. However, it took a full post-mortem to confirm that it was indeed Addington's, as it had been further mutilated long after his death. There were dozens of random stab wounds, several profanities and unflattering names carved into the torso, and the entire face had been rather crudely sliced off. The manhunt for DeWitt was on. But during this time, opinions on his play began to rapidly change. The Pen of Ambition was considered a smart exploration of the struggles a first-time writer faces in the industry. The pressure they're under, how hard it can be for them to make a name for themselves, all of which was very cleverly written in an intentionally amateurist fashion that helped put the audience in its main character's shoes. At least, that's what people thought, until it was revealed that this wasn't an example of someone at the top recognising the plight of those at the bottom, and was in fact just amateur writing by an amateur writer. There was no actual self-awareness to any of it. Critics who once praised it as a harrowing and sympathetic tale now saw it as nothing but self-insert trash. They say there was no accounting for taste, but apparently name recognition still goes a long way. Two weeks later, Kurt Addington's death was still the talk of the town. A special event had been put together in his honour. A sort of day of remembrance. The different actors Addington had worked with over the years had come together to perform excerpts from some of his most famous works. There must have been hundreds of people in that theatre. Friends, family, colleagues, admirers, critics, all came to pay their respects. All but one. One came for retribution. The night was well underway. The second act was about to come to a close, when it happened. Without warning, the house lights suddenly went off, plunging the entire theatre into pitch blackness. But not for long. A spotlight came on, illuminating a single figure as he walked on stage. At first, they couldn't believe it. It looked like Addington, back from the dead. Except it wasn't. If one looked closer, they'd notice the mouth hanging limply open, the lines of blood around the eyes and neck, and how at the back, it was all haphazardly held together with tape, pins, staples, and various other stationery. DeWitt was no surgeon after all. Removing Addington's already partially decomposed face was hard enough. Keeping it intact to the point where it was wearable was next to impossible. Although, disturbingly, I've heard patient number 199 has been giving him tips on the art of wearing people's faces. Guys, whose idea was it to put these two right next to each other? It's just basic common sense I'm asking for at this point. <sighs> but I digress. He was just standing there expectantly. The crowd was silent. Nobody dared make a sound. That may have been a mistake, as when he got no response, DeWitt threw up his arms in frustration and began shouting at the top of his lungs, Applaud, you sheep! He indicated to the layer of dead flesh strapped to his face, This, this is all you care about. You claim to understand theatre, to embrace it, judge it. But in truth, you know nothing. You know nothing of art, of passion, of soul. You're all just hypocritical liars, greedy benefactors, and spineless pawns to an undeserving, dream-crushing fool! He tore the rotting face mask off before hurling it into the stands, surprised by people's attempts to dodge it 
You'd expect them to start fighting over it like the fanatics they were. You're everything that's wrong with this industry! You're what's killing it! You all need to be purged! As the whip ranted on, one of the performers began sneaking up on him from behind, figuring he might be able to knock the guy out while his back was turned, only to stop when DeWitt removed his jacket and revealed his ace in the hole, a makeshift bomb vest. The second he held up the detonator, those in the audience began fleeing to the exits, only to discover each one was rigged with a bomb of its own. They'd been hobbled together from multiple explosive and pyrotechnic effects. On its own, his bomb vest would probably have only been enough to take out the stage and most of the first row, maybe the second. But when combined with the other four, the resulting blast would be more than enough to effectively kill everyone in the room. The now literally captive audience could do nothing. Nothing but sit, wait, and pray that they'd survive the final act. Luckily, DeWitt's tirade went on for so long that by the time he was about to finish, help arrived. And so, at long last, we get to the point of all this. The whole reason I unearthed this accursed file. Down from the raptors, left a figure, cloaked in light. A woman draped in a luminescent cape and hood, but otherwise dressed in an outfit much less impressive than the one she's known for wearing these days. Instead of the form-fitting bodysuit and mask, she wore a basic jeans and plain shirt combo, along with gloves, boots, and a face obscuring balaclava with a pair of those goofy looking star-shaped sunglasses on top. It was something she'd clearly put together in a hurry, shirt was even back to front, but then again she did have more important things to be concerned with at the time. When this stranger came on stage demanding he let these people go, DeWitt just laughed her off. After all, he was the one holding the trigger. If she so much as took another step towards him, threw a punch, anything, he could just press down on the button and it'd all be over. But she didn't have to throw a punch. No, she hit him with something much heavier. A dilemma. She pointed out to him that if he were to kill these people in hopes of saving theatre, he'd also kill himself and deny the world his oh-so-brilliant playwriting. Therefore, by dying, wouldn't he be damaging theatre just as much as they are by living? DeWitt paused. She was right, what was he thinking? He couldn't sacrifice his genius even if it was for the greater good. He needed a way out of this, but he couldn't think of one. Luckily, he didn't need to. For that moment of hesitation was just the opportunity the stranger needed to wrap herself in her cloak and unleash from it a flash of blinding light. Once DeWitt's vision returned, she was gone. Furious that he had played right into her hands, he cast aside his doubts and pressed down on the detonator, only to find its wire had been cut by the cloaked stranger now standing behind him, who then proceeded to roundhouse kick him in the head, taking him out. Yeah, if you were hoping for another big fight scene like last time, sorry. The mysterious hero departed as swiftly as she arrived, leaving DeWitt for the authorities. Strangely, as they dragged him out of the theatre and into the streets, past the hordes of onlookers, reporters and journalists all trying to catch a glimpse of this crazed maniac, he began to cry. Not with sadness, but with sheer, unadulterated glee. They see me, he said. They finally see me! Of course, that's not quite where this story ends. The Philip DeWitt case became headline news, with so much media coverage it naturally got out that I had been his psychiatrist. And before I knew it, the deal with Leighton and Law was out in the open too. The scandal was massive. Of course, right when I needed them the most, the law firm backed out. Even though they were big enough to survive this, they still felt the need to disassociate themselves with me. Charlotte clearly felt the same way. I came home one day and found the divorce papers waiting for me on the kitchen table. 
also couldn't help but notice that our shared bank account had been completely emptied, coincidentally, around the same time. Thanks, Charlotte. It's not like I could have really done with that money to buy myself a legal team. I was left to face the music by myself. Neither the judge nor the jury was sympathetic. There was only so much they could pin on me. Hard as they tried, I couldn't really be held too responsible for what happened with the wit. In the end, I was sentenced to 16 months in a minimum security prison for the mishandling and illegal trade of personal information. I only got one visitor while I was in there. Abigail. I could barely look her in the eye. All those times I talked to her about honesty, about helping others, and I let her down. I don't blame her for disappearing on me like she did. She must have been so disappointed. I actually only served eight of my 16 months. Got let out early for good behaviour. Ironically, I wasn't all that eager to be released. At least in prison I was being provided for. Outside, I had nothing left. My career was finished, my reputation in tatters, my practice shut down, my savings gone. I didn't even have any family to fall back on. I had no idea where Abigail had got to, Charlotte was long gone at this point, and all my other relatives wanted nothing more to do with me. When I was offered the position at Hillbrook, what choice did I have? At that point I was just happy somebody was throwing me a bone. Dr. Whitman was even kind enough to pay for my move to the States. Although I suspect that was partly because he wanted to move DeWitt out here as well. Who, by the way, has actually been loving his time in the asylum. Or of all the attention he's been getting. Says this place has given him plenty of inspiration for... his next play. I swear, if Hillbrook the Musical ever gets made, I will eat my own hair. And record. Wait, hold on. The mortician's report. It says here Barry's body is two months old. That's. That, that's not possible. I saw Barry last week. How? Barry? My god, you're alive! How are you. Wait, what are you doing with that lead pipe?